To summarise where we've been so far, ancient astronomy had the Earth at the centre and had things going around with epicycles, it had the Earth off centre, all sorts of funny things like that. Very complicated system, which gave pretty good predictions of where the planets, the sun and the moon are likely to be. Okay? Copernicus's big discovery was the idea of putting the sun at the centre. And Kepler's big thing was the idea the orbits are circles and are ellipses. All right. To be honest, that's about the level of detail that you need. Okay. With Kepler, we need to know his three laws of planetary motion, but that's about it really. Okay. Um, to kind of finish this section off a bit, can I just draw your attention to the fact that both these uh, improvements, Copernicus's idea of putting the sun at the centre, Kepler's idea of the elliptical orbits, both of those things are theoretical things. They're to do with our sort of theoretical model that we have of the universe, okay? Uh, Gentleman we're going to have a look at today, Galileo Galilei, um, is quite famous for, and is often, uh, I guess, often given as one of the people who really moved this whole idea forward, because Copernicus's first suggestion was largely ignored by most people in the street. Galileo really got things moving because he turned up with evidence. His big thing was finding actual evidence that the Earth goes around the Sun or the Sun goes around the Earth or whatever. Okay? He wasn't really about suggesting a new bit of theory to make things better. Galileo, for reasons that you may already know, um, was very big on the idea of actually using his eyes to see what was out there and use that to decide who goes around what, etc. etc. Okay? So today we're going to have a look at the work of Galileo. All right? and his very important discoveries. Rather than theoretical suggestions, these were very much discoveries. Okay? The story of Galileo has been made into plays and things, and it's often quite misrepresented, I think. So we're going to have a little bit of a, a look at the trouble that he had with the church and all those sorts of things, um, because he's often presented as a very, just, he said that one, one thing happened, the church said the other, and that was that. Like most things, it really isn't that simple. And you do need to know a bit of detail about Galileo's discoveries. Okay? Um, so, there's Galileo, a nice quote from him there, the idea of using your intellect, using your brain, using your eyes to see what's around you. Uh, in his mind, he couldn't really see how that could conflict with the church. Um, Galileo was a good Catholic right up to the day he died, I'm sure. Um, and a fight with the church was certainly never his intention. Okay, Let's just whiz back through where he is in space and in time. In time... He's at a time when astronomy looks like this. The Earth at the centre, as proposed by the ancient astronomers, the ancient Greeks and so on. The idea of epicycles helps to make prediction a bit better, um, but that's roughly where he is. Copernicus has made his suggestion, but I think many scientists are still not quite sure which way to go. Copernicus has suggested the Sun at the centre, but that didn't cause huge amounts of uproar because there was no evidence for it. Copernicus had no new evidence, he was just making a suggestion. Okay, so that's the kind of world into which Galileo was born. Astronomy at the time, uh, we've talked about this phrase before, astronomy was the clock and the calendar. Astronomy was very important because it was the clock and the calendar that ran your day, that ran your year. Religious festivals of all sorts are linked to the movement of the sun, the moon and the planets. Okay, and also if you wanted to go into the church, oddly enough, this idea that church and astronomy are fighting each other, if you wanted to go into the church, then you had to study astronomy. Um, becoming part of the church was very much, um, you had to study the motion of the planets and theories of things like um, the ancient astronomers and things like that would have been part of your training. Okay? Um, a very traditional idea, I think, of um, the universe. The earth in the middle, heaven is sort of perfect and up there and underneath there's hell or something which isn't very nice. Okay, that, you'll see why that's important a bit later on. As you probably know, Galileo was Italian, although that doesn't actually make much sense because there wasn't really an Italy until the end of the 19th century. In Galileo's time, the late 1500s, early 1600s, there would have been a lot of little states. Uh, you'll recognise some names there. The towns are very much the same, Florence and Rome and all those sorts of places. But they would have been organised around little countries. Many of the big Italian cities would have been the capital of a region like Tuscany or something like that. And although they had links with the ones around them, they were very much their own sort of ruling um, little countries almost, okay? And all this wasn't really unified until the 19th century. So Galileo was not just an Italian astronomer. Uh, he came 
from up the northern part of Italy. And when he first started work, he studied in a lovely city called Padua near Venice. And as you probably know, in the early 1600s, he came across this invention, the telescope, okay, and famously uh, read about the invention in Holland around about the early 1600s of a system of getting two different lenses of different strengths, lining them up with each other and using them to see what was coming. Okay, so That's a quotation from Galileo. Exactly what he did was to improve on that. Okay, He took an existing invention. The thing that science textbooks tell you about Galileo inventing the telescope isn't true. The telescope was invented in Holland in the early 1600s and Galileo heard about it and did some experiments with it and realised that he could make an improvement to it. All right. He could actually make it a bit more powerful and to give better images. Okay. And if you think about where he lived, near Venice, uh, a lot of trade going on, a lot of trade happening by, by sea. And being able to see out into the sea and to see ships coming from further away than you can with your eyes was tremendously useful. And the story goes, Galileo used to take people up the top of the towers with his telescopes and they could see ships coming which they couldn't see with the naked eye. Okay. And this was quite a big success. Galileo managed to sell his design to uh, the council in, in Venice and places like that, who gave him some money to, uh, to make these telescopes and things. And it was a big step forward for him. Okay? And thankfully, he didn't spend all his time looking at ships out at sea, although that was quite a profitable line for him. Uh, he also looked at the moon very famously. These are Galileo's famous moon drawings of 1600, not very much. And he's drawn the moon, as you can see. You might think, well, that's the sort of thing I'm doing for my coursework. What's so special about that? Very importantly is he's drawing on here craters and mountain ranges and valleys and all sorts of things like that, which are traditionally associated with the Earth. Okay? Uh, he's drawing Earth-like features on the moon, um, which doesn't sound much nowadays. But at the time, this kind of statement was quite a radical one, that the perfect things in the sky, the absolutely perfect, the you look at stars, they look like perfect little diamonds in the sky, they never change generation after generation. They move around some of them, but fundamentally, it's all just perfect stuff up there. There's no rust, there's no rot, no decay, no life or death, it's all just perfect up there. This idea that the moon isn't uniform and smooth, but it's got you know, Earth-like features on it, was a bit of a radical statement, okay? Um, suggesting things might be different to what people have seen. And as I'm sure you know, the other discovery you need to know about the GCSE is when Galileo looked at Jupiter, he famously saw four little stars. Think about it, any dot in the sky is a star in those times. He didn't realise they were moons particularly. He called them stars, but he quickly realised that they were going round the planet Jupiter. Okay? He watched them for a long period of time and realised that there were four little stars or four little moons going round Jupiter. Okay. Now, um, again, Galileo was not slow in coming forward, and very quickly, publishing books in those times was, you know, quite a labour-intensive and difficult process, but he got his book published with these discoveries in it, the moons of Jupiter and the Earth-like features, sorry, the Earth-like features on the moon, um, in his first book, The Starry Messenger, which he wrote in Italian, which meant lots of people could read it, as opposed to previous scientists who'd mostly written in Latin. And he had this book published. It was a tremendous success, uh, very puzzling. People weren't quite sure what to make of it. But these amazing discoveries, he was seeing things that no one had ever seen before uh, with his amazing telescope. It was quite a sensational book. And it kind of raised his stock, as it were, and he managed to move to a much more prestigious position in Florence, um, working for a very famous crest up there, which is the Medici family, uh, one of the great families of Italy, very famous in commerce and banking and all sorts of things. Um, and they were centred around places like Florence, and Galileo moved to work for, basically the Duke of Medici at the time, Duke Cosimo di Medici. Uh, he went to work for him, which was a pretty serious position as court mathematician and philosopher. It was a big step up from where he'd been in the north of Italy. But importantly, it brought him closer to Rome. Uh, some of the things he was writing, some of the things he was saying, up in Venice, top right in Italy, probably would go largely unnoticed. 
here working for such a famous family. Many popes have come from the Medici family. Uh, close links with Rome, geographically closer, but obviously very close links there with the church and with Rome. So as you can probably imagine, for someone like Galileo, this could well be a bit of a mixed blessing. Okay. And Galileo started to think about the ideas of Copernicus. Copernicus's idea that the sun might be at the centre. All right. Galileo wasn't too fussed about the theory of it. All right. He wasn't another Kepler. He wasn't trying to decide about the ins and outs of the theory, but he was thinking about ways in which he could decide between the two. In other words, what's the evidence? Um, so the big issue for Galileo at the time is what's the evidence? Is there any actual evidence between the two? Now, in the 21st century, we know about the ideas of Albert Einstein and the ideas of relativity, and that constant motion, just moving like that, it doesn't really matter who you decide is moving around whom. Um, but at the time, this was the big issue. The ancient view of the Earth at the centre with all its difficulties, the more modern suggestion, okay? But Galileo, of people often call him the first sort of true scientist and things like that, his question was, what's the evidence? Can you do experiments? Can you make observations? And of course, with his telescope, he really thought there might be a possibility of making observations that would actually tell between the two. So very much practical rather than theory. Okay. Um, there's some evidence. Joshua at the Battle of Gibeon. Apparently, if you read Joshua in the Bible, he talks about um, the sun being commanded to stand still in the sky, which presumably means it's moving around the earth. Okay. So that's one piece of evidence on one side. Um, and in fact, Gallo racked his brains a little bit on this one. And oddly enough, one of his most famous discoveries, which you have to learn about for the GCSE, originally came to him from, I think, being one of his students when he was back in Padua. One of his students, Benedetto Castelli, uh, wrote to him and said, hang on a minute, surely if Copernicus is right and the sun's at the centre, then Venus should show phases like the moon as it goes round. Galileo didn't think of that. Castelli did and wrote to him famously in a letter. So Galileo got his telescope out pointed it at Venus, as we know the rest is history. Very famous drawing there of Venus not only changing its phase, from circle to D shape to crescent like the moon, but also importantly changing its size. And if you think about it, if you imagine things going around things, it's very difficult for Venus to do that unless it's going around the sun. All right? So this is another one of the great discoveries of Galileo. Earth-like features on the moon, moons of Jupiter, and now phases of Venus. Although, oddly, phases of Venus wasn't Galileo's original idea. As I say, Castelli, one of those people, very important in science, who just gets, has got dropped away, I think. Okay. But on Castelli's suggestion, Galileo looked at Venus and found this. Okay. Now, this causes some problems because you're not just arguing between two scientific theories. The Church has some very clear ideas, or the Catholic Church that Galileo was a member of, had some clear ideas about how the universe goes. And the arguments between Galileo and what's in the Bible continues to be, you know, history as they say. There's a famous quote from Galileo that uh, the Bible shows you how to go to heaven. It doesn't show you how the heavens go. Uh, I'm not sure how accurate that is, but it's, a, it's an often quoted thing. Galileo made the point that there is no astronomy really in the Bible. Um, this idea that Galileo was up to destroy the church with his radical ideas. Absolutely not. Galileo was a good Catholic. His daughter went to um, a nunnery and was a nun, which is you know, a pretty high, high stakes position in, in, within the Catholic Church. Ca uh, start again. Uh, Galileo was not trying to pick a fight with the church. And his idea was that if you saw things with a telescope or you came across things in the sky which seemed different to the Bible then it must be because as a human you've misinterpreted the Bible. Uh, you really can't find anything Galileo wrote that suggests anything other than you know, complete acceptance of the Catholic faith and what's written in the Bible. In Galileo's mind, he's happy for those two things to exist side by side. It's often presented as a big, you know, just A versus B kind of battle. But if you look at what Galileo actually wrote, what he actually said, very much not. He saw science as very much something that you, know, you could perfectly well do whilst believing what was in the Bible. And if the two things didn't seem to match up, it's because you've misunderstood what was meant in the Bible. Although he makes the point that the Bible doesn't actually contain huge amounts of astronomy. Okay? Um, however, 
This was perhaps the not the best time to be saying things like that. And as you may know from your history lessons, this was the time of the Inquisition, um, when the Catholic Church particularly was very keen on finding people who were not um, who were not basically keeping to the Catholic faith, and they used some quite extreme methods, apparently, for um, dealing with them, shall we say. Okay? Um, which meant the Inquisition wished to have a word with Galileo, basically, about what he'd been writing. Uh, it's often said a lot of other people in the church, perhaps, um, who were quite jealous of Galileo's success, started you know, passing notes and whispering things in the direction of Rome, and so Galileo came to the attention of uh, Cardinal Roberto Bellamine of the Inquisition. And it was set up that the two of them would meet, although ironically they never did. Um, there was some good news for, for Galileo. Again, this idea of the, the Catholic cardinals on one side and Galileo on the other. There were famous paintings that looked like that. It's probably not true. Bellamine was very keen on astronomy. Although he was quite high up in the Catholic Church, he was a cardinal and he was in charge of bits of the Inquisition. Um, he was quite keen on the idea of astronomy. Again, he didn't immediately see it as a massive threat to the church and the Bible. And he was known to have taken interest in the ideas of people like Copernicus and stuff like that. So there was a bit of a possibility there, I guess. However, the two people never actually met, Galileo and Bellamy. I think they met once when Bellamy d delivered the... Um, as it says here, the verdict of the Holy Office of the Inquisition. Um, before Bellamine and Galileo could meet each other, the Holy Office of the Inquisition met and voted 11 to 1 that the work of Copernicus was foolish and absurd to suggest that the earth moves. It was a heresy against the word of the Bible, and his book, the famous book we saw the cover of last week, De Revolutionibus, was forbidden until corrected. Okay where it remained, I think, until the time of John Paul II in 1990 something. For over 200 years, it was a, on the list of books from the Inquisition, forbidden until corrected. Okay? And I guess, therefore, things were kind of taken out of Galileo's hands. Okay? Um, however, again, uh, Count Bellamine had, Cardinal Bellamine had some useful things to say. He said that the church would be able to change its view if there was basically irrefutable proof, all right, or incontrovertible proof. If you could offer, a bit like Galileo was saying, if you could offer some definite, clear, incontrovertible proof, then it would be possible for the church to change its ruling, okay? And oops, sorry. this sent Galileo off, who was a very great scientist, thinking of things which might do, all right? The church, the Inquisition, did not accept this or this, or this as incontrovertible proof. And they're not wrong. Uh, the idea of the scientists being the brainy ones and the church just being dog-headed and silly isn't true. Does this actually prove the earth goes around the sun? It doesn't. It, it, it suggests the medieval, the ancient view of a perfect heaven and a, a grotty earth isn't quite right. Again, these little chaps going around Jupiter, does that prove the earth goes around the sun? It doesn't, does it? Phases of Venus are more tricky, but you can have the phases of Venus. All it has to have is Venus going around the sun. Well, what if Venus goes around the sun while the sun goes around the earth? It looks a bit mad, doesn't it? Can you imagine that? So the sun goes around the earth, but it takes Venus with it. You get that. All right? So again, the, the idea of the church just being dogmatic and silly isn't true. The, the church said, well, I'm, obviously they've got their point of view and Galileo's got his. But these things, as scientists, we can agree with them. We can agree with Cardinal Bellamy. These things are not proof. These are not incontrovertible proofs of the Earth going round the Sun. Okay? Galileo spent a long time with tides. We'll come back to tides a bit later in the course. He thought to himself, well, if the Earth is moving along like a cart or something, how would we notice the motion? Well, if you ever tried to drink something in a moving car, you'll know liquids, are you with me? So you can see his thinking. Now we actually know the tides aren't to do with the Earth's motion around the sun particularly. And you can have tides whether the Earth goes around the sun or the sun goes around the Earth. But Galileo didn't know that. And it's good thinking, the idea that the water of the Earth might give us a clue. He spent a long time analysing tide tables. And spent a long, long time with it and really couldn't make any headway. 
Um, the problem of explaining the tides and the patterns in the tides is actually very, very difficult. And Galileo basically admitted defeat. He analysed tide information for a long time, but was never able to come up with anything. And in fact, we have to wait till the later works of Isaac Newton to uh, get that one sorted. So the church said, well, fine then. This is heresy. Uh, this is not something that good Catholics should be doing. But we'd be happy to change our view if there was incontrovertible proof. And I'm afraid that isn't it. As a scientist, you're thinking, well, it's, it suggests to me, I can see as a scientist, this shows me the Earth is probably going around the sun. But if your view is originally the other way, this really isn't proof. All right? He got into a large argument about sunspots. All right? It shows just the relentlessness of Galileo. He, everything he could think of that might prove that the Earth goes around the sun, not the other way around. Um, he got into a big argument with a... Jesuit priest called Christoph uh, Scheiner. Uh, he maintained that sunspots, which had been known about for a long, long time, um, he kept carrying very careful records of sunspots. I've seen some books that say Gallo discovered sunspots. He didn't. He may be one of the first people we know of to make really systematic, careful measurements of the positions of sunspots. And he was convinced they were spots on the sun. All right? Suggesting that the sun isn't actually quite as... To get the perfect thing again. All right? China said, no, they're little dots going around the sun. They're satellites. When you see a sunspot, the spot isn't on the surface of the sun. It's a little moon or something in front of the sun going round. And they, of course, neither could prove the other wrong. And they, they spent a long time arguing okay, with each other about this idea. But again, sunspots is an attempt by Galileo to prove that uh, his view is the correct one. Okay? Now, we have some good news in uh, 1623. Pope Urban VIII who was a friend of Galileo's. They had both grown up in, the, in, in Tuscany, in the northern part of Italy. So when they were younger, younger men, they knew each other. And basically, potentially, very good news for Galileo. All right? um, Urban VIII was from the same part of the world as Galileo. We'd met him before. And famously, Galileo went to the Vatican in Rome to meet with the new Pope. And they talked quite long about this problem of... The Copernican theory, which did seem to be getting a lot of right answers, that was making the math simpler, making predictions simpler, um, but did seem to be at odds with the Bible. Okay, and the agreement they came up with, or agreement, I don't think you can particularly argue with the Pope, do you? Um, Urban VIII said it would be acceptable for good Catholics to consider the Copernican system as a hypothetical idea. Now, this was very important to Galileo. This idea of Galileo being anti-church completely wrong. Galileo was trying to find a way that he could study these things and write about them without getting into a lot of trouble, uh, without contradicting his Catholic beliefs. And this was brilliant because it meant he could write about the Copernican idea, he could talk about it, etc., etc., as long as he presented it as a hypothetical idea. All right? Somebody from Poland has suggested this, let's have a think about it. Okay? To be honest, that's not that different to how Copernicus writes when he's, he put the idea up himself. Okay? However, I think Galileo, who was a very intelligent man, may have made a bit of a mistake here. Galileo basically was like a man released. He now had a way of writing about the Copernican system, and he wrote what he considered his greatest book called The Dialogue. All right? Which was, if you read the small print, it's the dialogue on the systems of the world. The two great systems of the world, the ancient and the Copernican, this book basically compares the evidence for the two. All the things we've been looking at, transits of v uh, phases of Venus and sunspots and stuff like that, he basically put the whole lot together. This is Galileo's big book of cosmology, if you want the translation into English. Galileo's big book, which he'd been dying to write for years but couldn't, Urban VIII basically gave him away by saying the Copernican model as a hypothetical idea was acceptable, was not heretical, then he would be fine. Okay? Now, we won't read through the whole of the dialogue, but it's a very simple book. As you saw, the thing there, there are three guys chatting away, and it's based a description of their discussions. Okay? And this was a fairly common way of writing books in those days. To make them a bit easier to follow, you wouldn't write like a textbook. You'd say, well, my name's so-and-so, and I think this, and this is what I think, and then someone else would do that, and then you'd argue, hence the word dialogue. Okay? The three characters in the dialogue are Simplicio, I think you can see where this is going, who believed in the ancient Earth-centred view. Okay. Um, on the other side, quite literally, Salviati, 
who believes in the Copernican view. And then you've got a kind of, Segredo is the kind of host, uh, the undecided, the layman, all right, who asks intelligent questions now and then of each of the other two. And this is how the dialogue goes. Um, however, Simplicio, I think he overdoes it a bit. Simplicio lives up to his name, all right? Simplicio says things similar to what Urban VIII had said. Um, Simplicio is clearly representing the Catholic Church. Although he never says that, it's pretty clear Simplicio is just somebody like an old Catholic Church person who just believes in the ancient view and won't listen to reason. He's just a complete idiot, all right? Um, and I think Galileo's mistake was he went a bit over the top with that, okay? Um, so, Galileo is therefore summoned to Rome, and um, the details of his trial are quite long and complicated. But basically, the Inquisition reminds him that his agreement with Count Bellarmine was that you could consider you can consider the two views against each other. You can consider the Copernican as a hypothetical. But it was put in the dialogue doesn't really do that. The dialogue really isn't that neutral. The dialogue is clearly favouring this one over that one, all right? And although Gallo probably wasn't given much opportunity to argue about it, it was the judgment of the Inquisition that this book is not just using the Copernican as a hypothetical tool because it presents shed loads of evidence for the Copernican model and very little evidence for the ancient, okay? And calling the, the, the guy who propounds the ancient view Simplicio, which you can probably guess what that was suggesting, um, didn't go well, to be honest. Um, and their judgment was that it's not actually a balanced book in any way. And if you read, you can get English translations, but you read it for yourself, right from the word go, uh, Simplicio is made look a bit of a fool, basically. And you might say, well, that's fair enough, because there, by the time he wrote it, there was quite a lot of evidence for the Copernican, and the arguments against things like the transits of Venus are really just, you know, just almost quite foolish. And Galileo, I'm sure, in his own mind, thought he'd done an accurate job, but I think he forgot about the time and the place in which he was writing. Um, and for that reason, <coughs> difficult time, okay? Uh, the book was banned, as you might imagine, until the 20th century. Um, Gallo is quite famous by now. He's also very lucky, I think, that he was, his patron was the Medici family. Um, I mean, when he went to Rome, he would stay here at the Tuscan embassy. With me, Tuscany is part of Italy. But in those days, Tuscany was a different country. There were an embassy in Rome and places like that. Um, he was kept in the Vatican for a while, but I think a bit of horse trading went on with the Tuscan ambassador, the Medici family, and things like that. And he was eventually moved to here, which is the Tuscan embassy in Rome. Um, and they kind of there was a bit of a debate over what was going to happen. In the end, what happened was Galileo was forced. Um, basically to abjure and to say that he'd never intended, I mean I think a lot of this is probably true, he probably did never intend to you know, say things that were against the Catholic Church that really wasn't, despite how it's often portrayed that really wasn't Galileo at all alright, he wanted to have the debate though, between what we traditionally believe from the Bible and what these new ideas were showing um, and some might say that's a perfectly reasonable uh, scientific way of going about it, but as I said before I think he picked his time and his place a bit wrong and in the end, um, I mean, I haven't got any pictures here, but you can probably imagine m many people, some quite high up people actually, some quite well known and respected people, have been put to death for things like this. Being found guilty of heresy, quite likely that the punishment would be execution or something worse. Um, in the end, he was put under house arrest in Arshetri, um, near, near his home, um, where he remained for the rest of his days. Um, we know a lot about it, interestingly, actually, from one of his daughters, I think his oldest daughter, uh, went into a convent at the age of nine and spent a whole life there and was a very good daughter. She wrote to her father pretty much every day, practically, and Galileo wrote back. And their correspondence is a really unusual one because we have all of her letters, because Galileo kept every single one. We have none of Galileo's letters. Uh, when she died in the convent, we don't know, but none of her worldly goods seem to survive. And you can buy a book, it's called Galileo's Daughter, and it is this completely one-sided um, 
discussion, but she writes about the things that are happening to Galileo, particularly when he's in Rome with the Inquisition. She writes to him all the time about this, that, and the other. So we know a lot about Galileo's life, actually, from his daughter uh, and the letters that she wrote to him. Um, but this is where he pretty much ended his days. And um, it's often a bit of a mystery to people. Urban VIII was allegedly a friend of Galileo's, and yet made no move to stop him. I mean, it may be that he's the reason that Galileo wasn't put to death. There are probably other reasons for that. Um, I think the mystery is quite easy. Again, astronomy doesn't stand on its own. Think of the time and the place and the history. Urban VIII was under a lot of pressure. You had the Reformation. Henry VIII, he'd taken the whole country of England, said, <coughs> we're no longer part of the Catholic Church. Um, people like Martin Luther, the Reformation, the Thirty Years' War... Uh, Urban VIII had come under criticism for being too soft on people who were basically saying heretical things. So for him to have pardoned Galileo, no matter how much they were friends before, would be completely impossible. His position as Pope, there's no way he could have done it. All right? Urban VIII basically stays out of this whole thing, um, but as I say, Galileo ends up under, under house arrest rather than some of the more unpleasant things that could have happened. So, um, astronomy there, I think, comes into conflict with the time and the place. In other times and other places, he could have probably got away with saying, let's have a balanced discussion between the old-fashioned and the Copernican system. But this is not the time. This is not the time. When this issue crosses Urban VIII's desk, he just wants rid of it, I think. He has much bigger fish to fry, much bigger problems facing the Catholic Church at the time. Um, and that may have affected the way things went to Galileo. I think. Okay? Interestingly, linking in with your physics lessons, shut up in his house, unable to write about astronomy, Galileo went back to work he did a long time ago, when he was a younger man, to do with motion, to do with how objects move, and in the end published a book which was, you know, before Isaac Newton, this is probably the most important book there is on how objects move, all right? And he may well not have done this if he'd been able to, to carry on with the astronomy thing. 